Thank you for the kind introduction. It's a privilege to be invited to this MFDS lecture series, but I want to point out up front that my topic, my presentation today, is not training materials on Q3E. Training materials are usually prepared at step four, and Q3E is just pre-step one, so we're very, very early on in the process. So therefore, my title, I can only share with you the challenges and the ongoing efforts. Now, the guideline is a quality guideline on impurities, assessment and control of extractables and leachables for pharmaceuticals and biologics. For those in the audience who may not be very familiar with the topic, extractables are those chemical substances that are detected from materials under experimental conditions such as harsh solvents or high temperature. On the other hand, leachables are those substances that are actually present in the final drug product, packaged final drug product. So if we we'll keep bear that in mind, that would be great. I have a disclaimer to make, the usual disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any of the organizations that the author serves or served, including but not limited to ICHQ3E, AAMI, ISO, TC194, Pharma, or LC. I'll describe very briefly the introduction and a background to why this guideline. And then I will also talk about Q3E, where it is, in the ICH roadmap, what are the objectives of the concept paper, and how we'll go about developing the content for this guideline. The most important thing is, of course, our challenges and ongoing discussions we have right now. So why Q3E? There are significant regional differences in the absence of a harmonized guideline. There's a lot of confusion with how ENL assessments are done and what control strategies there are. There is also increasing regulatory expectation of the process and product contact materials. In the early days, we used to think of extractables and leachables from just simple syringes, needles, maybe plungers, um, stoppers. But now with the advances in materials engineering, we think about the single-use systems that are being used in the manufacturing conditions. We think about also the drug delivery device combination products. You can look at very extremely complicated uh, packaged drug in terms of all the components that make up this drug product. And also there is proliferation in terms of industry standards and practices such as from ISO, PQRI, BPOC, USP, ASTM, and LC, just to name some. So what is the objective of Q3E? There are existing quality guidelines to deal with impurities from ICH Q3A, B, C, D, and also ICH M7. But even though assessments and control strategies are part of this impurity framework, and we want to address the multiple therapeutic modalities and dosage forms. We also want to apply the principles in the identification, qualification, and reporting thresholds as in the Q3 series. We need to characterize the assess we need to characterize the materials that come into contact with uh, the, the drug product and indirect contact as well so that we can enable the risk assessment of the leachables that will finally may be present in the final drug product because that's where patient safety counts. But throughout all this, we also need to make sure we understand the impact to the life cycle management from beginning to end to commercialization and also post-commercialization. We need to establish safety thresholds that are relevant to the toxicity endpoints, the route of administration, product indication, as well as patient exposure. There is also opportunity for the pharmacopoeia to align with Q3E. 
So all in all, we need a science and risk-based approach in compliance with quality by design principles. So where are we now? We say that Q3E is on track with IX, ICH roadmap. As you can see, we are here before step one, but normally for any guideline to even get to step one, it's typically a two to five year process. Right now, since inception, we're about three years into uh, the process, but we're not there yet. We hope to reach consensus, hopefully sometime this week, maybe early next year, but we're working very hard to reach that milestone. We already had one extension because of a pandemic. Our group is meeting only the first time in Incheon here for the full group. So this is exciting times for us and we hope to really work on consensus more effectively. We have a very large expert working group. It's composed of 18 members, each one represented by one to two delegates. 11 of the 18 are regulatory bodies and seven are industry. The founding members are listed here, the usual founding regulatory members, FDA, EC Europe, MHLW, PMDA in Japan. Also industry members include Pharma, FPA and JPMA. And you can see all the other members will have quite a bit of uh, work to do when it comes to regional adoption. We also have a plenary working party and that's Health Canada. They are also a standing regulatory member during the content's development, we try to engage all the experts. We have five focus areas and each area has a sub team. Some have accomplished the main goals. They have been sunset. Some are still working very hard to achieve their objectives. Focus area one is the overview and scope. You can't imagine the discussions that, that went on for the scope especially in nowadays with the combination products, combination products in terms of the drug and also the delivery device itself. We're treading very carefully not to get in the area of medical devices, but delivery devices are very important as part of the final drug product for combination products. Focus area two, chemical testing. That's where a lot of chemists get very, very busy. And they do their job trying to help the toxicologists have enough information so that we can do a robust toxicology assessment. Focus area three, quality assessment and prior knowledge. There has been so much prior knowledge. It'd be foolish for us not to know what they are and how to leverage that knowledge. Focus area four, safety assessment and thresholds. And this is the most difficult area. And this is where we feel that we are having the most difficulty coming to consensus. Focus area five, life cycle management. That is relatively simple because we do know that uh, there are acceptable practices out there how we manage LCM. So we do have guiding principles for the content development. The guideline is forward looking because we know that with the time we take to develop a guideline, it's usually years and years. We don't want this guideline to be outdated by the time we finish. We want to understand what advances there are with the materials engineering, device innovations, and also the new manufacturing paradigms, not to mention also the novel therapeutic modalities. We can't simply go with what are already on the market, but we have to look ahead. We will provide principles and concepts rather than requirements. These are, again, like Dr. Yao said, not meant to be cookbooks, but we want to provide the principles and concepts. We also want to allow for science and risk-based justifications, as well as expert opinions as appropriate. 
So very early on, we engaged ICHQ9. Uh, we had ad hoc consultation with the Q9 rapporteur as well as regulatory chair to understand what new concepts would be introduced in Q9 R1. And with their help, we framed the uh, ENL concept per quality risk management processes. You see here with the risk assessment, where risk assessment applies in the extractables eligibles, that's where we do chemical characterization, that's where we do safety and quality risks. The second bucket is risk control. Knowing what the ENLs are in materials, drug products, and what, mater what ENLs may come from the processes and the finished product, how do you control the risk from extractables in materials or leachables in final drug products? Understanding how you control those are very important. Sometimes the risk can be acceptable. Sometimes the controls may be very simply just eliminate or reduce the, the extractables levels or the leachables levels. Sometimes you may have to substitute an alternative material and that may not be that easy uh, because materials are engineered for maybe some other purposes, not necessarily for the purpose of your drug product. So substitution is not as simple as what we think. Then the risk review is the life cycle management. As you begin looking at uh, early development and all the way through commercialization, and then after commercialization, there are critical changes in your raw materials or changes to your drug product. You might want to look at a different route of administration. You may want to expand the delivery devices uh, that are used for the delivery. So life cycle management is very important. Now I come to the challenges and the ongoing discussions. There's a lot of interdependency of the chemical characterization of materials and safety assessment of final drug product. The crux of the issue there is that when we characterize a material, how low do you need to go with your analytical methods so that you know you have good understanding of what these impurities are coming from the material. And that's where safety assessments of your anticipated compounds may be. You, you rely heavily on prior knowledge, know what the materials may leach, and then you can do your um, compound-specific assessment. Sometimes you have to do it also on the unknowns so that you can help the chemist come to a level where you say, are you comfortable with your analytical methods development? Do you have sensitivity enough to detect such low levels. Correlation of extractables in the materials with the leachables in the drug product. Not all extractables wind up in your drug product. The, the leachables, as we hear time and again, they are only a small subset of what you learn from your experimental conditions when you study your, your materials. So that's good news because throughout the, the process, your manufacturing process, as you optimize your manufacturing process, you should be able to remove uh, most of the, the extractables. The prior knowledge, their understanding what the vendors or suppliers may have done uh, in the engineering of your material is very important. You can have also certificates uh, regarding some of the bad actors that may come from certain materials. Knowing what the vendors know is very important, but that's not the end of the story. You still have to do your own due diligence. The more you know, the more you can streamline the chemical testing. Safety thresholds to reduce the demand on toxicology assessments. When you do an extraction study, when you look at the, the chromatic chromatogram, you may see thousands of pe peaks, literally thousands of peaks, and a lot of them may be just noise. 
the chemists can go down to extremely, extremely low levels in PPBs and even below. Look what they can do with nitrosamines. So it's important to have safety thresholds that will help us say, okay, below this threshold, you may not have to do uh, a full-blown toxicology assessment. Sometimes you just don't even have the toxicology data to help you do such assessments. We also want to encourage the use of in silico in vitro and read a course to supplement the weight of evidence for risk assessment. It's a lot of pieces of information out there. It's a wealth of information, and knowing how to use it is very important. And with the advances in computational software programs, a lot of it can be done without demand on use of animals. The 3R principle really applies here. So therefore, we remain optimistic in achieving the upcoming milestones. As you see here, we're still just reaching consensus. Hopefully, we will reach consensus sometime before February of 2023. And step one sign-off is not until May 2023. So we have a very tight timetable. We don't know what kind of comments we will be dealing with yet. Hopefully not in the thousands. So by the time we reach step four, as we approach step four, that's when we'd like to hopefully come back and do the training materials. Here is my acknowledgement slide, and all the names of experts are here. I want to definitely uh, thank our regulatory chair, who's not able to come here today, and our supporter, Ms. Amy Stanton. And the experts are listed here, and their names are on the ICH official website. With that, thank you very much.